Welcome to Coffee and Poets. I'm your host, Bob Stanley, and I'm here interviewing Allegra Silberstein, the poet from Davis, California, and our producer is Lawrence Dinkins, and it's March 20th, 2016. Time goes fast. 2016 sounds funny, doesn't it, Allegra? Oh, I know. It. it is so amazing. It's also the first day of spring, or is it Monday tomorrow? Today. It's, it today, is today. This year, okay, yeah. good. Because some years I think it's the 21st. And other years, it's the 20th. It goes back and forth, but I know. I, I'm not sure exactly why. It's this, <laughs> the sidereal calendar. It, I think it has to do maybe with, with leap year. Oh, that could be too, yeah, yeah, because we've already had an extra day. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So we have about an hour for poetry. We get to talk, and I just have so many questions to ask you. I, I've admired your work for many <laughs> years. I have your new book here, West of Angels, from Cold River Press. It's only a few months old, I think. Right. And uh, just came out. Well, actually, it's a year old now. 2015, it came out. Oh, okay. Well, March. Time does go fast. I'm pretty sure it was March, yeah. In the notes, I was reading that you said that you first, your love of poetry began as a child when your mother would recite poems as she worked. Right. And maybe you could share some thoughts about that. We're kind of your earliest remembrances of poetry. Okay. Yeah, it's, I grew up on a farm in, in Wisconsin and, and uh, was in the Depression, and people didn't have, at least on the farm, you had food to eat. So that, that was a ble always a blessing. Um, but there, there wasn't money to buy books and this kind of thing. And my parents didn't have a huge education, uh, only to eighth grade, but they had some wonderful teachers, and poetry and literature was an important part of their education. And my mother knew, well, lots of them were nursery rhymes, but other, other things that she would read, and, and not read, she would say to us while she could keep working. <laughs> there wasn't any maid to help out. <laughs> it, was, it was my mom. And I, I really think that's what started my love of poetry. And when did you first start writing, or what do you first remember? Well, I first remember when I was in the throes of sorrow in high school. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> that writing we won't talk about. <laughs> well, it's a good place to start, right? It gets right. us all going. Right, right. And, and, and I think that writing does serve that purpose, you know, for people to be able to express at any time in our life, to express a sorrow, to get it out into words. I was at a reading yesterday at Sacramento Poetry Center, and it was beautiful. Mellon got up to read this poem about the death of her mother. It's taken her several years to read, and she broke into tears as she was reading it. It was the most beautiful, wow. powerful kind of thing. Even if I couldn't even hear all the words, it was, you know, I, I, I just think poetry has such power for us. So it's just a way to share emotions that you might yeah. not get to or you might not be right. able to share otherwise. Right, right, yeah. yeah. And, um, of course, that's just one of the, one of the pluses of poetry. It's, it's, it's also, I think, um, I read someplace that any good poem is actually a love poem. And when you think of love in its broader sense, that, that's true. I, I think of, of, of just the wonder of this world we live in, the drive over here, seeing those magnificent clouds, and then all of a sudden the rain starts coming down. And it is, it is just so amazing. And I read someplace also, and it just struck me as so true that, you know, why on earth in the process of evolution was man created? You know, <laughs> what are we necessary for? And this person said, well, the one thing that humans can do that the animals maybe cannot do, but I'm not even sure about that, is to appreciate and be in awe of all the wonders about us. And that makes so much sense to me. It makes me think of uh, dolphins leaping in the, in the surf and wondering if they, they're doing the same thing. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, that's why, I prep, you know, we think we humans are so special, but... Honestly, we really do not know. <laughs> we could be really special, yeah. though. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because I was reading through um, West of Angels, and I just, there, there were many poems that are, I guess, what I might call blessing poems, right? Where you're just kind of <laughs> thanking, you know, just saying, you know, uh, a litany of things that you That's love. Right. And, and this poem came, came to me. There are so many reasons for singing. Oh, yes. 
And so I wondered if I could read it to you, and then Would maybe you? you could talk about it a little bit. And then yes. if you have some, looks like you've right. got some poems to, <laughs> to read as well. But there are so many reasons for singing. Beauty of the sunset sky reflected on red tile rooftops, lighting the soul locked in the chaos of mind and war. The birth of a child, the voice of a people heard in the land, our passages, but oh, Tennyson, our ship seems floundering now. Perhaps we need a crossing to the bar, drinking ale to reach the still point, singing our song. We are little lost sheep who have gone astray. So, so reading that, I'm going to ask: Is that a, is that a a blessing poem, or are you? bemoaning something you, are you and are you it's it's probably a little of each some of each because when you look at some of the horrors that are going on in the world we are little lost sheep we've gone astray and so that poem came out of out of two things two two feelings and that's another thing we can do in poetry you know we can combine more than one more than one thought and i, I just recently came across this poem, and I wrote it quite a while ago, but um, I'd like to share this one if I could. It's just called, it's not in my book. It's called Blessings. A blade of grass, still holding pearls of morning rain. A broken branch, redwood tree delights my nose. Narcissus blossoming all along the fence. One daffodil in the middle of the orchard, swollen buds bursting into white on the almond trees, green leaves sprouting on the elderberry, blessings counted this day. And may the blessing of rain be for you when you have a raincoat and umbrella. The blessing of sunlight be for you when you have sunglasses and a wide-brimmed hat. The blessing of tears be for you when joy flows so swiftly through your body it cannot be contained. The blessing of touch for you when strictures hold back the rush of living water. These too be blessings a piece of glass honed by the sea into an amber heart, an empty bottle that held perfume, two grapefruit clinging to the same twig, a piece of petrified wood with little holes where worms lived, a poem known by heart. <laughs> Wonderful. So that's very new. It's actually not very new. I, I, you know, the thing of it is, sometimes it's, I have a hard time. I, I lose things in my computer because, you know, I, I don't put enough information in, you know, where, where you says the save. And so I come up, I accidentally came across this poem. It was oh, that's written, good. So, <laughs> so it's a secret poem that you discovered. Right. <laughs> And it was written in 2009, and, but it was, right, it was probably written in February. Because that's when all of these things would have been happening. You know, the narcissus, the elderberry leaves, and all that kind of thing. So I know by reading it, you know, the month when I wrote it. <laughs> and you heard it here on Coffee and Poets for the first time ever. <laughs> the, yes, that's right. From, from the lost poems of Allegra. <laughs> so a lot of inspiration from your farm. You grew up on a farm. You live on, you have your own farm. Yes. How does that play into your work? It very, very much. The Actually, the going outside and cutting grass, pulling weeds, planting seeds, transplanting things is a kind of therapy when um, one is bit getting, you know, when, when there's just so many things pressing in on one. And it's just so great to be outside doing those those things. Um, and then I come back to, to, to the writing and, and the other kinds of creation that I do with greater peace. And... You know the expression, you can take a girl off the farm, but you can't take the farm off from the girl. You can't take the farm out of the girl. <laughs> I, I think that is so true for me because there's just something so nourishing about the earth. 
and getting your fingers dirty in the dirt. <laughs> and in the words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, this poem, Garden Reflection, is just right square <laughs> on that sentiment. And this is another one of the ones I picked. So maybe we're Good. kind of on the same wavelength today. But can I read this one? Yeah, please. <laughs> Garden Reflection. Considerations of everything are beyond me. <laughs> I only know that dahlias bloom in my garden. The bulb gives birth to blossoms. That sunflowers light the roadside from the scatter of last year's seeds. That when flowers die, the helix in the seed, in the root, in the bulb, will come to life again. And I know with delight of tongue and eye the blessings of my fig tree that blossoms within the fruit. I love that uh, the helix in the seed, in the root, yes. in the bulb will come to life. And, and I know... Reminds me of some other poem. I'm trying to remember what that. And I and I know, and I also know, it's a Wallace Stevens poem. It'll come oh. to me later. And I also know some, this something. Right, right. Oh, well, I can't yeah. remember. I shouldn't even I, bring it up. <laughs> Lots of sensory images. I mean, you're always, the, the poem that you read had so much, you know, it's almost like you made sure that every sense was represented, right? <laughs> Taste and touch and, and scent. What poetry models, maybe we'll shift from inspiration of earth and look at the inspiration of poets that have affected you. Who do you look to? Who have you learned from? Uh, who are your favorite poets? It changes. I just, there are, there are just so many that, that I love. And sometimes it's just a matter of who I happen to be reading at the time. I loved all of Neruda's work and the um, Robert Frost, when I was younger, oh my goodness, I, I well, I still love him. He's, he's, he, I, I feel the farm in him, okay. the earth yeah. is in, in him so, so strongly. And I'm also inspired by all the, I go to so many different poetry readings. Actually, I could go to one in Sacramento every night or every day of the week, I think. There's something going on. But just listening to the other, other poets, you are, another, you are one person who inspires me. I, I, love, I love hearing your work. And, and with so many, so many people, I'm, I'm thinking just of yesterday, of, yeah, yesterday um, where um, uh, there were a bunch of poets who who meet with John Haig and her, her Sunday group that she has at the meeting. And I just thought, oh, my goodness, what a wonderful, how wonderful all their different ideas were. There was one, oh, I should have brought mine along. There was one who wrote a poem, you know, about Monday's child is fair, is fair of face, Tuesday's child is full of, but she added all kinds of various little things on it. And I'm Thursday's child, so Thursday's child has far to go. But... I didn't think to bring that along with me because <laughs> that was a poem I had fun fun doing because thinking of how far I've come from the farm in Wisconsin, I never would have dreamed. Well, first of all, I would never have dreamed that I would get to be the old lady that I am right now of, of 85 years. So that, and then I never dreamed I would ever become a poet or a dancer. I was hoping when I was little that that maybe I could go into theater, the idea of, of being on the stage and playing another part other than who I was was very intriguing for me. <laughs> so do you, have, do you have any poems that are like persona poems that aren't you? Or are you oh, yes. Yes. I, in fact, one of the things that happens with me, sometimes I read about someone and, and the poem just almost grows by itself. Um, I have a, it's a pretty long one, but I, I, I read, I'd, I'd like to share it with you if you think I've got time. It is, let's see if I can find it here. Anyway, it was the story of this Palestinian who is telling why he can no longer stay um, in, in um, he's, he's, oh yeah, here it is, why he can no longer stay in Jerusalem. Um, and it is just such a moving story that, you know, when I read about it, it almost, the poem almost wrote itself. And um, there was another one, I don't have that one with, well, it could be in my book, I'm not sure, about a young man, his name is Victor, telling about being in the war. And, and, and it, he ended up by saying, you know, he had never looked up and seen, he was in 
Iraq or Afghanistan, I can't remember which one, but saying he'd never been able to see the stars the way he did that night because of coming from L.A., of course, you don't get to see the stars that yeah. much. So these are, these are just poems that you just have, you feel like you have to tell someone else's story. It's Exactly, yeah. And, and I've got another one, too, if we have time, I'll, I'll read it. It's about my brother. I am Syed Kashwa. When I was 14, I came to Jerusalem. I saw a library for the first time. And I, I love that, you know, because... I could identify with that. I didn't know about a library till I was, you know, much older too. Um, I saw a library for the first time in the village where I was born. My math teacher came to my parents' home and told them that the Jews were opening a school for gifted students and I should apply. It will be better for him there. I cried when my father hugged me and left me at the entrance to the grand new school. I had seen nothing like it in Tira, my home. That first week in Jerusalem was the hardest of my life. I was different. My clothes were different. My language was different. All the classes were in Hebrew. I sat there not understanding a word. I cried on the phone and asked my father to come and get me. He told me, only the beginnings are hard. In a few months, you will speak Hebrew better than they do. In the first week, our literature teacher asked us to read The Catcher in the Rye by Salinger, in Hebrew, of course. It was the first novel I had read. It took me several weeks. When I was done, I understood two things. I could read a book in Hebrew, and I loved books. Very quickly, my Hebrew became nearly perfect. I began to read Israeli authors, Agnon, Mir Shali, uh, Amos Oz. I read about Zionism, Judaism, and the building of the homeland. During these years, I also came to understand my own story, began to write about an Arab who lives in an Israeli boarding school. As years went by, I knew I wanted to change things, wanted to tell about the other side wanted to tell in Hebrew how my grandfather was killed in the battle over Tira in 1948, how my grandmother lost all our land, how she raised my father while she supported her family as a fruit picker paid by the new Jewish owners. I wanted to tell about my father who sat in jail with no trial for long years because of his political ideas. I wanted to tell the Israelis another story, the Palestinian story. Surely when they read it, things would change. All I had to do was write, and the occupation would end. I told myself, just be a good writer. You will free your people from the ghettos they live in. Twenty-five years I have written. Nothing has changed. Twenty-five years I have written knowing bitter criticism from both sides. Today, I am watching Jewish youth parade through Jerusalem, shouting, death to Arabs. In Gaza, they are likely shouting, death to the Jews. I know I have lost my little war. Know that I must leave. I stand in front of my bookshelves, Salinger in my hand, and then I put it back on the shelf. I won't take any books. I have to concentrate on a new language. I must find another language to write in, find another language to live in. And I'm, I'm so moved by this life and this sense of, because every now and then I, I try to write a poem also where you can make some kind of change in the world and of course, Writing this poem was, in a sense, following in that in that that same kind of idea, and there are so many people who have, you know, worked for years and years and years and tried to make the change, and one could almost get discouraged. And then you read these <laughs> stories, you know, of, of Jews for Peace and 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 um, all these other groups that are working so hard toward peace, and you say, no, we can't give up hope. <laughs> Ever the optimist, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it is terrible. 
you see people I've known, friends of mine, who who were so engrossed in the horrors of life that that it affected their life and, and, and destroyed them. So I mean I think I think we have to see the things that are the horrors, but I think we also have to have to understand that there's also the other side that is so full of raw beauty and goodness. Yeah. Yeah. You had when you were poet laureate, the first poet laureate of Davis, yes. as I recall. Yeah. Um, did you have a chance to address the issues and injustice as well as count the blessings? I mean, it seems like you you have a lot of balance in your work that you're doing both. Um, not not precisely that way. Although you know, when there were various um, things politically going on, like like somebody coming in new for the city council or something. I could, I would, they would ask me to write something then. And a part of my writing would be to the idea of you are responsible and may you have the wisdom to, you know, to, to do the things that will make things better for this, better for this country, for our, for our city. That's good and that they ask you to do that. Yeah, right? yeah. It, was, it was, it was very nice. It was very challenging and lovely. I think, oh, I got that. I think I wrote it in the form of a, I think I wrote it in the form of a pantoon because it was that that forms can be kind of a fun thing to do. Keeps people's attention yeah. too. <laughs> so you use forms a lot. You like to use forms, or to be perfectly honest, I think some. You know, I belong to all these different poetry groups, and one of them is is the, uh, we call it the First Friday group, and it's one that uh, Joyce Odom has led for years, and I was invited to join it. If, well, I guess quite a few years ago now. Um, I was going to say a few years ago, but I think it's more than a few. And what happens is somebody in the group um, forms, takes, uh, gathers together four different uh, pictures of paintings or, or, or whatever, and then one poem. And then we have to write to the painting and to the poem. And so <laughs> that gives you a lot of practice in, in ekphrastic writing, which is which is fun. But sometimes it's kind of overwhelming and you have to have these five poems done once a month. And you're, and I find sometimes that if I just use a form, a pantoum is really very nice because <laughs> you have two lines that get repeated, you know, with some variations if you want. And so a form can help you out sometimes. Kind of feels, gives you some lines. You're just writing towards the lines. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then sometimes what happens, I use, I'll, I'll start to use a form and then just, just, just forget the form. And, and let the poem take care of itself. <laughs> That's a good thing. You trust your own instincts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. And so you mentioned ekphrastic poems, and of course you're an artist, you're a dancer as yeah. well, and a singer as well. How does, how does dance uh, work its way in, or how do you feel like the balance of poetry and dance? Does poetry help you with dance, dance with poetry? Well, in fact, what I'm... I've, in the past, what I've done is taken someone else's poem and found music, you know, and then read the poem over the music, and then gotten a CD for that, and then and then danced to that, and then created a dance to go with that. And just recently, I I um, did this it, this CD with the music and used my own poem for it. And uh, again, it speaks to peace. Who's who's the composer? This is my land, the country where my heart is. I'm blocking on. It's not Copeland. The, no. No. I don't it's, know. It's it's um anyway. But I I will I I think I've got with me the poem. Oh, good. That I used for that, which I called one, and it has to do with the fact that here it is. And so, and it was really fun. And I've, I've at a couple of different poetry readings now. I have, I have danced. I brought along my little seat, my little um, CD player, and the CD, and have danced with. And people have really enjoyed it. So that's been a great deal of fun. And I want to do some more of that. Um, it's just, it's, it's a lot of work trying to figure out just the right music, and just the one poem that, that you want to use for it. But this is called One. If we let go the muddled mind, search. Without cherished bias, we are one people. If we let go of fear, search only with the open heart, we can be one people. We are one with the Sunnis and Shiites of Iraq, seeking freedom of faith with nationhood. 
We are one in the fear that haunts darkened days, one with the people of Kurdistan. We are one with Palestine, with Israel, and the people of Afghanistan. We are one with the mothers of Central America seeking refuge for their children. We are one with the children, with all immigrants and their dreams of a better life. The silver moon that lights the night of the East in a few hours, the same for me. We are one world. We are one, one in our sorrow, one in our dream of a better tomorrow. Beautiful. Thank you. So this is, this is how I get into my po politics. Well, sometimes I get into some, I don't think, I haven't brought it with me. Joyce Odom is, 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 you know, a great critic. She'll say, ah, oh, this is not a good poem. It's just political. So, oh, she doesn't like political poems. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, it, you have to be very clever with it, you know. <laughs> well, Joyce is a great teacher, of yeah, course. Yeah, she is. You're, um, it, it's interesting because you, I mean, you touch on, you know, some of the, the huge conflicts in the world today, and yeah. yet you, you approach it with your characteristic optimism. <laughs> and, you know, that we are one, one and that we will get through this. But yes. then when you mention each one that you mention, and the, the, the listener, the reader kind of winces and thinks, I know, Ooh. I know. It's just all over the world. You hear these stories of, of these people, and then sometimes I, I can hardly believe my good fortune. You know, it, it is such... Some of us are you know, yeah. lucky in different ways. Right, you know. right, right. Yeah, and I think of these poor people, you know, who have scats and scats of money and feel like they're so poor. And I feel so blessed because I feel I don't have... My income is small because... I'm a retired teacher, and I didn't have that many years before I had to retire. The funny thing of it is, I, there were some problems in my own personal life that had to do with it, but I was just feeling so exhausted. And uh, somebody I knew who was 50 years old had died, and somebody else had about three people that I knew of had, had just passed on. And I thought to myself, well, if they're offering a two-year service credit, I might as well I might as well take that two-year service credit and not worry too much because who knows how long I've got to live. And this was in 95. So <laughs> ever, since, ever since my retirement, my life has been so full with dance and poetry and singing and all these wonderful things. <laughs> so so if, if poetry is richness, and, yes. I, and I sense that in yeah. all you're saying, at what point in your life, do you, have you always had poetry? Has it always been this strong current, or has it ebbed and flowed? And, are there, uh, and, and, and when did it become such a strong force? Actually, while I was, I guess, I, I think probably it became a strong force. Well, it started, as I said, in high school, when there was all these teenage miseries. And then I think... It grew even more when my marriage was dissolving, and I was still. I and and um, then I was teaching after that, and the the, I, the poetry started be, became very much more more important. And then I was lucky enough to get a poem published. Um, somebody told me this. I remember I was still teaching at Birch Lane. Somebody told me to send in um, this poem. Oh dear me! It was. I don't think. I, I'm pretty sure it's. I'm not in there, but I'm not sure. But anyway, I did, and it got accepted, and that was wonderful. That was the that was, golly, that must have been about in '93 or '92 or '90 someplace back in there. <laughs> and there's something about having a poem accepted by someone that someone kind you've of never spurs met spurs you on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe and the so, last 25 years or so. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I'm a late bloomer for poetry and for dance. <laughs> well, that's good to know. We, we can, you know, and you're still improving, right? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. I have uh, one more poem here that I'd like to read. And okay. maybe you can, you can think of one more, too. I think we still have time. Okay. This is also from West of Angels, and it's another garden oh. poem, but it's a different garden. It's not your garden in... Uh, uh, South Davis, right. but it's Monet's garden. 
in Monet's garden. In Monet's garden, there is a bridge, a place to enter when soul flowers wilt by the side of the road. Outside the frame, avenues yawn into distance into the vanishing point. Outside the frame, wild mustard seeds, naked in the earth, wait for spring rains. They come, color the wayside golden with exuberant blossoming that lightens the heart. But it is Monet's garden I want, the bridge for crossing over. Yes. <laughs> and that poem meant a lot to me. And this is, you know, following in a different vein completely. But I want to read this one. This is a poem I wrote for my brother. Um, his name isn't Joseph, but that doesn't matter. It's important for the poem. But it's a poem that so many people have told me it meant a lot to them. Um, my mother, um, in, in her later years, uh, actually for quite a while at the time I was growing up, had schizophrenia, and, and so uh, she, she suffered a lot in her life. But this is called My Joseph. We envied you, the youngest, as if you had been singled out for a coat of many colors. We said Mom spoiled you. We were wrong. Love made you strong. You grew to manhood with courage enough to hold at bay the gnawing years that would chew upon the heart remorselessly, the way packs of wild dogs devour the downed lamb. You stayed with mom and dad, held back the dark that folded in on the farm, that held fast to our mother. You stayed to tend the fields, to mind the cattle, and we were free to leave to embroider our garments with threads of red and gold. You stayed steadfast in your faded coat. And one of the reasons I, I, I like that poem also, too, is, is, you know, I think back, I, I probably think a lot of the poetry in me is a gift from my mother for all the years of her illness. She'll, I just feel so that she gave me so many gifts. And my, from my father, the gift of the love of the land. And um, so I, I just feel so blessed by both of my parents. And the embroidering our our coats with with red and gold is that is that the poetry and the dance maybe a little bit? <laughs> yes, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, any anything else? Any other thoughts uh, on your poetry, poetry in the world? Um, All I can say is, the Sacramento offers so much in the way of poetry. You know the the. Every mon every Tuesday night, I have every Monday night. There's a Sacramento Poetry Center with something going. Every Tuesday night, I have my writing group that's led by Daniel Powell right now. Um, I know there's something going on Wednesday night, but Wednesday night is one night I have to have for something else. That's ma that's mahogany. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Wednesday night is my night for bluegrass singing. Okay, <laughs> and and Thursday night there's something at Luna's or at Natsulas in Davis. And Friday night, who knows what's going to go on on Friday night. But, you know, it's just, the poetry is so alive and well here. It's beautiful. And um, I think... I think we're getting we're, we're getting a little a little bit we're trying to catch up in Davis to all the things you do here. Well, you've been a big Sacramento. part of what happens in both towns for sure. Because I'll, I sometimes uh, I see you at everything I go to, and somebody says, "Oh, well, I saw Allegra at this, and you weren't there." So, <laughs> so uh, well, it, it's really been an honor to have you to hear some of your poems and to chat, and uh, and I just. Thank you. It's been fun. I thank you for having me. This, it has been fun. Yeah, this is cool. Well, this is uh, Coffee and Poets on March 20th, 2016. It's a, a rainy Sunday afternoon, and I'm Bob Stanley, uh, having interviewed Allegra Silberstein, and our producer is Lawrence Dinkins. Thank you for listening. <laughs>